take my hand Stuck in dark thoughts and beliefs all alone Calling out to you, I can't make it on my own Shows me the darkness is made up by me Takes my hand and leads me to fly free Help me trust that you hear my call You take my hand and we fly free. 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 Who am I without the pain? You whisper.
Okay, well tonight we're going to follow up our first session with some Q&A, very interactive, so questions you have or application things, or maybe you want to, you had an insight and you want to carry that on a little further, or maybe apply it to what seems to be your life situation, we can carry it on from there. We'll go till about 9.30 or so tonight, and then we were thinking tomorrow will be a, a beautiful full day, but we were thinking we would start approximately around 10 a.m., so you can have a good night's rest and breakfast, ease into the day, very soft, and then we'll start the first session around 10. We'll have a break, uh, for maybe two, two and a half hours. We'll lunch, I think, at one, and then we'll have afternoon session, perhaps a session and movie uh, in the afternoon, and then we're going to ask the kitchen, or maybe already have asked them to push off the dinner tomorrow, uh, because they have problems with making it earlier, but they have no problems with pushing it back a little bit. So we can kind of be in the flow all day long to get a real good full day in, I think around 8 o'clock. Um, it will be the dinner time, we'll ask them to prepare dinner. And then we'll have a good night's rest and we'll move on and have a session again on uh, Sunday, a wrap-up session too. And for me, I have to let you know, it's to me it's all about an experience. I, I'm really not one to split hairs over like theologies. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just as happy being with people who call themselves atheists as as those who call themselves believers, believers in whatever. You know, it doesn't really matter. Sometimes, you know, I meet with somebody and they're all happy and talking joyful and, and they say they believe in pink pyramids. I said, all right, that's great. I mean, the semantics don't really matter to me because underneath it all, we're all the same one anyway. So why split hairs over anything? I have found in my life that the teachings that resonated and that really tickled my heart, sparked my heart the most, were what some people have called non-duality teachings, that everything is one. And the duality is this uh, divisive, uh, like a veil that we, you know, the ego has us believing that we're separate from each other. It's, it generates a world of opposites, everything from hot and cold and fast and slow and male and female and masculine and feminine, and I, I just cannot think of spirit in dualistic terms. Uh, I realize that those are like symbols that are stepping stones, but to me, oneness is what it's all about. And we all sh we share the same spirit, so we are the same one, and it's only a trick that has tried to split us off as if there's conflict between each other, uh, or even conflict in our mind, you know, it's so many levels of the mind and, and there's so many seeming levels. But in the end, I feel like what we want is we want an experience of our connectedness. It's like the Beatles said, all you need is love. You know, it's really that simple. So I, I don't really split hairs. I feel like everybody is doing the best that they can based on what they believe. So we don't really have to try to put anybody down or lift anybody up. There, there really aren't special people or, I mean, I don't even try to find the difference between, they call them the saints and the sinners. I feel like we're all saints in training, is what I tell people. And sometimes they don't, they still, please don't say that, David, and they say, what's wrong with saints in training? You know, come on, we have to embrace that we're all on our way back to the spirit and, and to the remembrance of our source. So, the other thing is to me, I enjoy all kinds of semantics, so I'm really not rigid. I mean, I used the Course in Miracles for a number of years, but I was recently at a castle up in Holland and this uh, gentleman interviewed me on the last day. And he would say, well, what would you say you are? are you?" Are you a Course in Miracles teacher? I said, no, I don't even like to use that label. I really am not into labels. I feel like we're just, we're wanting an experience, and then whatever words we use to come to that experience, we have to have a great allowance for those words. 
I remember when I was in, uh, I taught a class one time, a psychology class, and, uh, and I, halfway through the semester I, I had this realization where I think I was transcending university and I was transcending school and education, but I told the class, I said, I'm not capable of giving you a grade at the end of the semester, so here's the criteria, I'll put it on the board and you will grade yourself based on completing the assignments, but I'm, I'm not capable of dividing up grades. I think that was one of the last classes I taught, I couldn't, couldn't get hired anymore. <laughs> they won't hire a professor who won't grade. But to me, grading was evaluation. I even had a, a person in there who, who wrote his paper on different ideas and beliefs, but um, I don't know if it was on devil worship or uh, Satanism, I think it was on Satanism, and uh, he wrote a long paper, and in it he, he had shared some ideas that part of his Satanism belief was that everybody should take responsibility for their own state of mind. So I marked, love this idea, <laughs> in the middle of the Satanism paper, because I really am not into judging the form of things. And there also was a time when I was invited, one time in California, I was invited to, to go on to an Indian reservation, it was Native American. And so I walked into the house and I, right away I, the, the father, the husband came up to me and he said, can we talk? And I went off on a walk with him and talked and he was the Native American. He was telling me all about the Native American tradition and how they honor the sacred and, and how they, they open up to the great spirit and so on and so forth and he said but uh, he said I just had to talk to you first he said because uh, my wife she's like Catholic and she's into Jesus and everything and she said good luck with her and then I went off and talked to the, the wife and we walked around the reservation talking about Jesus and she was she came back and the husband says you're awful happy and she said I, I'm great you know, David really understands me. And then uh, they were sitting there and um, I went off with the teenage son for a walk and then we came back and the husband and wife were beginning to talk after I talked to each of them in their own language. And then they, uh, the, the son came in, the teenager, and he was so happy. He said, oh, I had the best walk and talk with Jay. With David, he understands me perfectly. And they're like, the father and mother said, what could you possibly have talked to David about? You don't have a spiritual bone in your body. We've never met any more of a, you just you have nothing to talk about. And he said, no, we talked about the matrix the whole time. He totally understands what I'm talking about. You, ne you never listen to me. But, so the key is for the experience, you get into the joy and the connection, and then the Spirit gives you the words. And you don't, you know, if they followed me around with a the camera, they probably said I would look like a spiritual chameleon, because my words change so much depending on if I'm sitting next to a Buddhist in a plane, or sitting next to a Catholic nun, or, or to an atheist. You know, a lot of atheists open their hearts to me, and they just say, I cannot believe in a God that would that would judge people. I cannot believe in a God that would demand sacrifice. I cannot believe, you know, and they go on and on about their, their gripes about uh, all that they've been taught about God, and I say, yeah, me either. I can't believe in any of that, and I mean, atheists and I, we do the high five, and there we go. We're back, we're in the joy, but we're connecting around a presence that's underneath all of us, and it's not based on theology. That even in A Course in Miracles it says that in the end you must forget this world, forget this course. Uh, it, in the end it says you must transcend theologies, the theological beliefs, and you must go into an experience. Almost like if you think of philosophies, religions, movies, and everything is like trampolines. The whole point is to spring off of the trampoline and join with an experience that you are, that, that is your essence, not to stay stuck on point, counterpoint, or you believe this, I believe that. And, and I 
I talk a lot about forgiveness in some groups, but then I talk about it in different ways, like the quantum field, or, you know, just, there are so many ways to describe something, but really, it's like the old story of the, of the master pointing to the moon. You know, you don't focus on the thumb or the finger, you focus on the light that the master is pointing to. We're all the same light. You don't get caught up in splitting hairs over the finger or the thumb or the position or anything else because that's where it's just more, uh, you know, division. So I will open it up now because we had a beautiful session and I see Mike has got his hand up. Two questions. One is about the ego. So how do you define it? How do you see it? Because you utilize the word as if uh, it's 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 acting, so it's you know. But is it something that is part of our nature to protect us, or do you see it as some kind of a universal? You mentioned Satanism, whatever. Or this just constructs. Is there some kind of a logic or a vision behind it? That's the first question. The second, about these trampolines, like um, you chose the chose the way uh, of the, the course. Have you met throughout your path other trampolines that you uh, acknowledge as obviously people can use Catholicism or whatever, any of these religions, but what I mean really those that you see being sustainable, sustainable really what, what I consider the course being sustainable by mean that you can create that at a recurrent as I said earlier, I mean, we had here ayahuasca experiences and what not, the boga, other plants, but they take you up, you can transcend, but so what are trampolines or the things you met throughout your, your I guess you meet a lot of very interesting people around the world. Yeah, so yeah, I can talk to both of those questions. Well, the first question is about the ego and what it is. I would say it's, it's a belief and and you might even say, to give it a little more uh, of a sense of what it is, it's, it's a belief system. So it's a belief system that's entirely based on fear. Uh, it, the mind, when it is in heaven or nirvana, when it is in a state of perfect oneness, uh, there are no beliefs in what is. Uh, beliefs are something that arose after the seeming, we could call it, the Bible calls it like the fall from grace and the Genesis, and all spiritual traditions talk about some kind of uh, detour into fear or fall from grace or whatever. It goes in many traditions and many philosophies by different names, but, but the ego is synonymous with, with belief and synonymous with actually the belief in separation. The belief that it's possible to, to be apart from your source. So, in reality, it's impossible to be apart from the Creator. The Creator and the creation uh, are together. If, even if you said the Creator, the ultimate Creator is, we'll call cause, we'll use the scientific word, and effect, we'll call Christ. Not Jesus, the man, but I'm talking about the Spirit. Uh, where Jesus said, the Father and I are one. He was basically saying, the cause and effect are together. Uh, it's, it's heaven. And, and the, the effect can never leave that cause. You, why would a perfect creator create an extension that could wander off into darkness and wander off into fear? It doesn't make any sense. Why would, even in this world, we get apple trees from apple or we get apples from apple trees, oranges from orange trees, you know, we get broccoli from broccoli plants, you know, we get children from parents. If, if the source is spirit, then it must be that the extension of the source is spirit too. The spirit comes from spirit. You don't get flesh, something that's temporary and here one day and gone the next, from something that's eternal. Why would something eternal ever create something temporary? I could never figure that out. In my mind, it just, when it said in the Bible, God created man in his likeness and image, I thought, well, God created man as a spirit. It must be that perceiving the flesh is part of some kind of trick 
or distortion because there's sickness and death and all kinds of things that don't go well with perfect love. You know, it's a, it's a confusion. So, ego is just, we'll say, the belief in separation. And it's only a belief. So, if, if it was made up, we'll call it a make-believe, fictitious belief. But certainly if it was made up, it can be undone. It, even if it was seemed to, to make up a world where there seemed to be real pain and suffering and division, there certainly must be a way to correct it. So actually for me, when I think of ego, the synonym that I like the best is error. 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 Yeah. Mistake. Yeah. It's an oops. Yeah. I mean, it's, why, why call it, you know, like Satan, like it's this big powerful thing that's fighting against God and, or a fallen angel or whatever. It's just an oops. And, and to me, that's been the most important thing in my life, is when I see it as an error, I see it as an oops, then, then it's not a sin. Like sin, you feel the weight of that word sin. It's almost like a black mark on your soul. Like, you messed up big time. <laughs> and admittedly, this world can look like big time, <laughs> but, but that's what, to the spirit within, that's helping us, that the ego is an error to be corrected. And then it says it's not only to be corrected, it already has been corrected. So the instant that that error seemed to be like a blip on the radar screen, it was answered immediately, not in time, but, but absolutely immediately. So now the real thing then would be, if it's already been corrected, then am I willing to accept the correction? That's really what it comes down to for me. Am I willing to accept it? Now, there's one way that you can delay that acceptance, is that it's called projection. If I keep blaming the world, if I blame my parents, if I blame history, if I blame dictators, if I blame the government, and I blame politicians. If I blame anything of this world for the error, then I think that's a projection. That's the blame game. That's pointing a finger and saying, you did it to me. I'm a victim of something outside of me and I have no control over it. And I always like that analogy that every time I was start to complain about the government, or complain about society, or somebody I didn't like, Jesus would be in my mind, and he would, he would just be saying, David, you're pointing the finger again, you're pointing the finger, and he said, look, there's three fingers pointing back at you when you point the finger, one for the Father, one for the Son, and one for the Holy Ghost. <laughs> the Holy, you know, the Trinity was like pointing back saying, stop, Blaming. Don't blame anybody for anything. Nobody has harmed you, but you believe that you've separated, and that's the error that has to be corrected. That's why we were talking, when you raised that question about racism, about inequality, I had, I was an activist. I, I was a big activist, so I, I was involved in different kind of um, protest. I was involved in different kinds of groups. I, I was, I was, I, at, at one point, you know, Jesus had, had to kind of say, yeah, you're, you're an activist, you're, you're an angry activist, that's what you are. Uh, and, and I'd say, yeah, and he'd say, how does that feel? Do you enjoy it? Do you enjoy being angry? And I said, well, I don't know if I really enjoyed it. He said, well, you must get something out of it, because why do you persist at being such an angry activist? Wouldn't you rather accept the correction in your mind for the distorted perception that you have, and be a happy uh, extender of love instead of an angry activist? And I said, well, yeah, that, I would like that. And he said, well, you, there's, a, there's work to do. We've got, we've got to do a lot of healing on the inside. So the ego, to me, is an error. The ego is a belief in the mind, but it's, we can't project it out onto form and say, oh, Hitler was the ego, or Osama bin Laden. It's too convenient to point a finger at, at our brothers and sisters and say they are the problem. They're the tyrant. 
And because what it does is it just perpetuates this belief system in victimization. I am at the mercy of something beyond my control. How will we ever find happiness if we're always at the mercy of something that's outside of us? And our state of mind is at the mercy of how they treat us. There's a line in the Course in Miracles where Jesus says, Beware of the temptation to perceive yourself unfairly treated. Well that one's come back to me hundreds, thousands of times. As soon as I start to would get some kind of disagreement, anger, resistance, something going on, then that would come back to me over and over. Beware of the temptation to perceive yourself unfairly treated. That, that, that's an attack thought in my mind, that I'm still holding on to a grievance, and then I see it as a witness outside of me, as if somebody's doing it to me. So it took me seemingly a lot of practice and quite a few years to start to realize that the world wasn't happening to me. The world was happening for me. The world was happening as an opportunity for me to see. I see a question? No, no, no. Okay. The world was happening as an opportunity for me to take a look at what I actually believe. What are these projections that I'm steadfastly holding on to? So, it's different from thinking that the ego is like an external evil force, because it's just a belief. And I'm reminded many times of that, like the movies. Um, I remember in um, The Wizard of Oz, how there's uh, the Wicked Witch of the West. And I, like many children, were quite frightened by watching this green witch with this pointy nose. And I would watch that movie and I would kind of have a little bit of shiver before I'd go to bed with this green witch with this wicked sounding voice, <laughs> my pretty, you know, and, and the hands and everything, and I was like traumatized. But actually, in that movie, if I go back to it, you know, Glenda the Good Witch, which is kind of a symbol of the spirit, said you always had the power to go home, tells Dorothy. And in the end, it's a bucket of water that undoes the Wicked Witch of the West. She just gets a bucket of water on her, and all that's left is her hat. Mm -hmm. She just totally, I'm melting, I'm melting, you know. That's a, to me, that's a really good analogy of the ego. If you, that bucket of water is the spirit within you, kind of splashing water all over this belief in separation, this uh, error. So much so that you, you feel the correction, you feel the wholeness, <clears throat> you feel the completion, you feel joy. And miracles do lead to a state of joy and, and happiness and peace. So that's the, the first answer I would say is it's, it's, a, it's a belief to be undone and it's an error to be corrected. And it, it's an error that already has been corrected, but the whole point is accepting the correction as an experience. Like that's what you've been talking about. It doesn't help us to even have this great high theology or high philosophy until we actually have that experience that we're guiltless, that we're truly innocent, then it's just words, you know, it's just another thing like that. And then your second question was... The trampolines. The trampolines. Sustainable utter distribution. Yeah. I, when I started on my search for answers, I was in university, so I spent a lot of time in psychology, philosophy, religion. I kept being drawn, even though I was in urban planning, <laughs> was my, I was studying to be an urban planner, I was drawn in the library to, to philosophy, psychology, and religion. And then the more I studied these things, I started to, I became interested in humanistic psychology, the feeling that everybody was good at the core, and that we, Somehow we, we were tricked or we were mistaken. We had distortions going on to cover over the goodness. And then I became interested in transpersonal psychology, which was finding the connecting 
spirit or the unifying spirit that was transcending the personal mask of personality. So it's transpersonal. And then, the more I became interested in humanistic psychology and transpersonal psychology, I, I went out to California, to La Jolla, California. I went to a humanistic psychology conference, and in between going to the different seminars, I kept being drawn to this video that was playing of a Course in Miracles teacher from India. He was a Sikh. His name was Tara Singh, and he was teaching the Course with an Indian accent on, uh, on video. And I was at this psychology conference and I was like, my eyes were riveted. And so I stood there in front of the video as it played, and they had two of his students and some books and everything, and, and I listened to this man, Tara Singh. He's probably, at that point, maybe about 70 years old. And when I was listening to him, I, it was like he was speaking things that my soul already knew. I was, it was resonating, connecting with what he was speaking about, and yet he was, it was so much, I was resonating over and over, and I had never heard of him or A Course in Miracles, but I, it was a huge resonance. And I just thought, this is the strangest thing, like I, I can relate to everything he's talking about, but my parents never talk about this. Come to think of it, my friends <laughs> never talk about this. But I know what he's talking about, even though I don't have anybody in my life that talks to me this way. I, I could relate to the video. So then I talked to his students and they said, well yeah, why don't you come, we have a center here, not too far to the north up in LA, come and visit us. And, and they said, here, I think you should buy this book that he's talking about. It's called Course in Miracles. So, there they put it, and I feel all this love as they put it into my hands, just washing over me, almost like, uh oh, Peter, we've we've just hit the gold mine <laughs> we've been searching all these years for. I could feel it just by touching the book. And then they said, why don't you take one of Tara Singh's books that he's written called Nothing Real Can Be Threatened. And I said, okay. And then there's another book that was by Ken, Kenneth Wapnick, and it was called Forgiveness and Jesus. And I had been raised as a Christian. So I said, okay, give me all three. Give me A Course in Miracles, Nothing Real Can Be Threatened by this Indian course teacher, and Forgiveness and Jesus by Kenneth Wapnick. So I went up, I went to the place, I walk in their center, and all my heroes are all over the wall. There's Gandhi, there's Mother Teresa, there's Yogananda. I'm like, what is this, like this TV show, This Is Your Life? Uh, my parents are never talking to me about these people, but in my heart I'm drawn to their teachings, and they're all over, and there's sayings all over the walls from A Course in Miracles too. So I'm like taking it all in, but it was one of those real surreal kind of encounters. Like here I am on South Burnside Avenue up in, New in Los Angeles, California, and my whole deepest feelings are all over the walls in photographs and sayings. And I start to get this feeling like I had when I first came to the Course, like, your life will never be the same. Like, this, this is going to send you onto a different trajectory from whatever you believe you were going to do with your life. This is, this is telling you right now, oh no, it's going to be different. So, that opened me up. I read, had already read a lot of philosophies, a lot of psychologies, a lot of religions, and I would, the tickle was resonating with a lot of things but it was sprinkled around. The Course seemed to be total, 100% tickle. Every time I opened it up, the fact the first time I opened up the Course, when I was at that conference, I just opened it up and I started to t soak it in, and I started to lose my breath. I actually started to lose my breath. I, I was having trouble breathing because it was such an overwhelming feeling of love. And then I was able to squeeze out a question in between losing my breath. I went, who wrote this? 
<sighs> Book. <laughs> I was able to squeeze out the question. <laughs> I didn't have a lot of lung action going on there because I was like, oh, from everything I studied, I was like, this is huge. This is like the answer to my prayer for I want to have an experience. It was like a like a gold mine of direct. It was like a self-study book, without gurus, without mantras, without having to do all these different things like in spiritual communities, the do's and the don'ts, and you do this a hundred times. And, this. and the more I opened it up, I thought, wow, this is really, this, this is from an awakened mind. Because I, I was just stunned. I, at the time, I had read so many things that I thought I was pretty good at, at understanding the underlying, I could pick up any book that I would read anywhere, I could pick the book up and I could spend 15 minutes with it and I could tell you the underlying assumptions of the author. I would give you a printout of, oh here's what the author believes, this, this, this and this. I picked up the course. And all I could say was, this author is not in time and space. That's all I could say. This author is not in time and space. This author is, is somehow written a book from beyond time and space. You know, like Einstein had said, you can never solve a problem at the level of the problem. I had in my hand the answer that, that was beyond the level of time and space where the problems were being experienced. So I got a real strong sense of that I amness, you know, before Abraham was I am. It was just, it was staggering. And then, in initially I just gave myself so fully over to the Course that I actually had a whole stack of books always on my nightstand, because I was an avid reader. But I actually put them all away, and I didn't even read the newspaper or the comic strip. I mean, it was almost like I had a lifeline from eternity that was just dropped down <laughs> like into time and space. Like, here's a rope, and I'll grab a hold of the rope anywhere you want. You can grab it low, grab it high, just grab the rope, whatever. Grab this rope and you hang on for dear life, and you follow this rope to where this rope came from. And so therefore I did not read comic books or newspapers. I wasn't interested. I, 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 it was shocking. If somebody told me that I would go to California and come across a book, when I would stop reading all the other books and the newspaper and everything, I would have just laughed and said, yeah, right. I'm not so closed-minded that I will just read one book. I'm sorry. But actually that's exactly what I did because it was so much like it was speaking right to my mind from eternity that I, I couldn't, couldn't avoid. I mean, I had to give myself over to it. Now, on to your second question. Are there other trampolines? I, oh, in 44 countries and in the last 30 years of travel, yeah, I call them reflections. I've seen many trampolines. I've, I've seen it in I've been invited into ashrams, I've sat with, with gurus, I've, uh, I did go to Tara Singh right about this time, exactly 30 years ago, I was in a room with Tara Singh, the man who I first had seen on the video, and he got to the stage like an hour and a half before the audience showed up in the stage. And somebody told me, he just goes and meditates on the stage before the audience gets there. I said, cool, I'm going to meditate in the, <laughs> in the chairs while he's up on the stage meditating. And I went into really deep meditation where when the people finally started filing in around me, it felt like they were all just energy patterns. I was in such a deep uh, state of mind. So. If I had to summarize, I would say that out of all the philosophies and teachings, and there are many great ones, that I would say that there are a group of teachings that are what I call non-dualistic teachings. They don't really teach like 
that heaven and hell coexist, they teach that one is real, love, and everything else besides that love is an illusion. So I found it in the deep teachings of India, the Advaita, Advaita Vedanta, the, the great deep teachings of the Vedantas. They have non-dualistic teachings in China, deep teachings that go back many centuries. And so I began to look around and I began to find teachings and teachers that were called non-dual. And uh, I would say that there's a lot of good ones. The thing about the A Course in Miracles is it not only explains that oneness is real, love is real, nothing else but the love is real, but it actually explains why it seems so difficult to wake up to that love. It explains how clever the ego is, it, it exposes all of the ego's tricks, and it, it shows that the motive for the making of this world, you could call it the Big Bang or uh, the projection, the giant projection or whatever, is the motive for this world is hatred. The world was made in hatred. So it's a little different than my Christian upbringing, you know, reading Genesis. God created the heavens and the earth. This was saying, well, you got half of it right. God created the heavens, not the, the celestial realms, but heaven that Jesus talked about. Pure realm of love and unconditional love and oneness. And the rest was a projection of the ego to hide. Because once that belief in separation was taken seriously, then there was a tremendous feeling of guilt and intense feelings of fear and separation. By taking something that's just a silly idea, serious, then that's what was behind. And then there were parts where Jesus would say, you, you cannot uh, really heal yourself, you, you cannot be released from this you know, until you really look upon the full extent of your own self-hatred. So I was like, oh, this ego is like major self-hatred. And it plays out in all kinds of ways. It gets projected onto the body, it gets projected onto the world. But there's, in mind, there's a tremendous guilt and self-hatred. And forgiveness is in our mind as well, but this is the reflection of love. This, this looks upon the whole world with very soft eyes. You know, it, it, it's not fooled by the by the error at all. And so that means that I started to meet people, authors, writers, teachers, people who were in song, dance. Um, myself, as I started, I was very shy, I was voted most quiet in my senior class in, you know, in high school, and I started to be drawn out of my shell into this sense of wanting to teach or to extend the love, so I could strengthen my own awareness of love, being real. And then I met lots of people who were into it. I mean, I, they came out of the woodwork. When I would travel around, I, Jesus, I would say, was showing me lots and lots of people who, who were reflecting the, the, the love. I was accepted into homes, I traveled, I, at the first trip out, I had a little three-cylinder car, but people said, let me put some gas in your car, and they offered me money, they took me into their houses, they fed me. It was mind-blowing. I was raised with the Protestant work ethic. You know, you work, you earn, you save, you spend. You know, that's just the way it works. That's the way the world works. That's all I knew. And then Jesus was, after I let go of his 10 years of university and trying to get another degree and all those things. And I gave it myself over to Jesus fully and he said, okay, I, now I'll, I'll guide you, but you're going to have to trust me. And that was hard at the beginning because I had all this... doubts, you never come to people like to questioning, to like I challenges had, that would like to do. What you I, had, I had some, some doubts at the beginning, but but once he got me out of my hometown, and once he got me out of my 
environment. He got me out on the road. I didn't like to travel, so he took me traveling. He got me out of my comfort zone of thinking I knew how to, how to control my life. And he got me out on the road, and then it was like, he said, hold on, I'm just going to knock your socks off. <laughs> like, I'm going to hit you with so many miracles that you're, you want to be convinced? I'll convince you, I'll, I'll show you. Yes. No, because I really, I wanted to, to talk to you about this because like one month ago, uh, ago I, I was just, well, I think in my life were not working the way I wanted and when I was feeling stuck it so I thought I have to go, I just heard a voice, you have, you have to go and I said where, where do I go? And then I was just, I didn't know the answer and I tried to remember the exactly word that came for me was where were you? The happiest, the happiest moment, the happiest. And then I remember about Italy. I had wonderful moments in Italy, and went to Italy like in 2013, and I, for Florence. And then suddenly I was in Assis. Uh, I didn't, I didn't know Assis. I was with a friend, and I had the most wonderful experience, like very strong experience there in Assis yeah. and in Italy. Yeah. So I remember, okay, Italy. I bought a ticket for, uh, to go to live in Italy. I'm leaving Brazil. And everybody like, what, what, what are you doing in Italy? I don't know what I'm doing in Italy. I'm just going, I have to go. But where? Do you have work? Do you have a place? Do you have, I don't have anything. And I'm at Taurus, it's like, I'm, a, I, I think I'm crazy. And since I bought this ticket, since I bought this like one month ago, mm -hmm. a lot of miracles are happening. Like this, this thing came to me. Two, two days uh, uh, after I bought the ticket, there was a, um, a very good job offer, the best job offer, like, this. and I have been working, I have been, and now I have a question, I, I have talked to, to Louise about this, that there, everything that I wanted before I buy the ticket, that I was trying to control and to get it, uh, suddenly they are coming for me, but I have this really, this is about an ego question, like, um, I, maybe I have this opportunities, a lot of opportunities to stay here with the jobs that I wanted. So my question is, once I, I made a choice for being happy and trusted, I had to trust something that I have no control, I just trusted and I didn't know anything. Um, that's something about being connected with the light and maybe with my purpose. And that's my truth. Um, and the tests come like two, ta two days be uh, uh, two days after the job. So th is this a test, or for being happy, for for permitting to be happy, and for trusting life? Everything I wanted came for me. That's a doubt because I, I actually that's like I'm happy and enjoying, but. It's this job, just I relaxed and I said, okay, I trust your life and then it comes. Or I'm really going to where I must go and like, do you really want to go? Are you really sure? Do you want to, you want, you not have anything for granted? Are you risking something? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. You know, when, when Francis and I have been to China, how many, six or seven times? We actually had people showing up from all over China to come and see us because somebody had translated my teachings into Mandarin and spread it all over China and they were coming. And we actually would go so deep into these kind of questions that, that people would... We had a couple that basically tossed everything away, and I mean everything. They even got down to one suitcase. The, the gentleman, that's all he had was one suitcase. And he was listening to my stories of all that had happened to me and the trust and how it grew stronger and stronger when I just trusted that everything would be provided. He was actually down to one suitcase and I think he was like in Shanghai and he was, he was at a, I think a bus terminal or train terminal and, and basically he was going to go up to Beijing and he, he just had a suitcase full of clothes and A Course in Miracles book. That's all, that's all that he had left. He'd gotten rid of everything else. And then he went over and he looked and he, he tossed the suitcase out and the book, he let go of his course book. 
he put the course book in the suitcase and let it all go, and he walks over to a janitor and says, you see that suitcase there? It's all yours, and inside that is a book that will change your life. I mean, he literally got so into the guidance that he was tossing his clothes, his only change of clothes, and the course book away. He hopped on the train, and there was two of them, Susie and, and uh, this guy, I forget what his, I forget. His Hope, name. Hope. Hope. Hope and Susie. A man named Hope and a woman named Susie. And they went to Beijing. And then we continued on doing our travels. We ended up in Beijing, and they said, David, there's a lady here. She's very wealthy, but she's so much into spiritual awakening that she, she's got this giant center, and she flies teachers in, and she's got this amazing... She knows about the Course, but she knows about a lot of other pathways, a lot of other trampolines. She's got, got them all under one roof. And, and we're like, okay, what do you want? And they said, you need to come to the center. So we go to the center. Guess who's there? The two that <laughs> tossed everything away, including the course book and their clothes, are at the center. We met them. We met them and they at a park, I think. We talked to them and they were like, oh yeah, we, we were saying, where are we staying? We're at the center. She, we do it for free. She, she handles everything for us. We don't have to pay anything. We're just there serving and she's covering everything. Well, it just was such a strong witness. We all just kind of rejoiced in the park, like, wow, you really pitched even the smallest things that you were relying on, and it really went for it. Now, Jesus did dictate a little prayer, a prayer booklet that's now part of the, the course that they put it in on the latest edition. It's called the Song of Prayer. And in the Song of Prayer, Jesus says, the secret of true prayer is to forget the things you think you need. He's like saying, you really want me to knock your socks off and really show you who you are? The ego is going to say, well, be prudent, be practical, you know, you, you've got to watch out for this and watch out for that. Now when you were telling your story, I had another thing that happened to me about 10 or 12 years ago where I went down to Cali, Colombia. And I'm down in the city of Columbia, and I'm teaching pretty much every day. A friend of mine offered me her apartment, so I'm doing sessions pretty much every day in her apartment. And this woman comes, and she stands out with the Colombians, because she's got blonde hair, and almost all the Colombians have very dark hair. She comes in, she's bilingual, she's listening, she comes back, back again, back again, finally she comes over to me and she said, I don't know, I feel like I want to serve, I want to serve the plan in some way. And I said to her, I said, okay, well, I have this website, but uh, you, can, you could really help if you could just translate my website into Spanish. So I, I would have a Spanish website of this. A lot of my teachings had already made it down there and been translated to Spanish, but I said, a Spanish website. She said, yes. Yes, yes, I will do it. I will come up to your little peace house in Cincinnati, Ohio, and I will translate the website. She goes home, and then the next day she calls me, and she says, I've got a terrible problem. As soon as I said yes to you, as soon as I committed to translate that website, I got this, I've been trying to get this certain kind of job for the longest time, and I got this message saying, come and interview, we have a job opening, and her ideal job, ideal job. And she said, is this a temptation from the ego, or is this the way that it's supposed to go? Am I supposed to go for this job, or am I supposed to keep my word with what I told you and <laughs> translate your website? And I said, well, the ego is very ingenious. As soon as you get that strong feeling of something that you really feel strongly eager to do, it doesn't matter whether it has any logical sense, you know, if it's very strong, it's guidance, then the ego will come in there and do anything it can. We've seen movies like that, where somebody gets the thing that they really want, and then all of a sudden, here comes the ego zooming in to, to try to distract them and tempt them away from the thing that they felt so strongly. So she kept saying, what should I do, what should I do? She said, I said, 
well, what do you feel when you're praying? And then she says, well, I, I want to come and translate your website, but, oh, this is the best job. This is what I've been <laughs> wanting for three years, she said. For three years, and I, she said, I said, you just have to pray on it, you know. I said, you really have to pray on it. And so she finally, she prayed and prayed, and she, I didn't hear from her for a couple days. She got dressed up in her best power suit uh, to go fly to Bogota and to uh, interview for this job. And there was like a hundred and some applicants, and so it was a long process. She got all dressed up, she goes to Bogota, she goes through interview, another interview, other interview. It, it goes down from a hundred and something to, to the final two. She's one of the final two for this dream job. And then, because there was all this interviewing, she brought one change of clothes. So when it got down to the final interview, she would have her nice, fresh clothes and everything. So she got down to the final interview, and it was just her and this other woman, and then she looked around, and she was going to change her blouse and do this and that, but she looked around, and there were some construction workers looking in and at her, and she said, I'm not changing here. So she looked around, she saw a closet. So she said, I'll go change in the closet. Well, this is one of those kind of closets that if you go on the inside and you pull the closet mm -hmm. closed, it locks the door. So she locked herself in wow. <laughs> right before the biggest wow. job interview, her, her dream job, because at some level of her mind, there was a conflict here. She had said yes to me, you know, and, and when something comes through me, it's like the Holy Spirit saying, join me in this, you know, this would be helpful for the whole universe if you help translate this to Spanish. But the dream job kind of tempted her. She went in the closet, she, she changed her clothes, she's already confident to go out there and, and kill the final interview, and she can't, she can't get out. In fact, that's such a tight little thing that she's like looking and it, the door will not open and she's like banging and hollering, please somebody let me out and she's getting a little bit frantic. Also, it was kind of almost an airtight closet and so she, in the end, she started to think, oh my God, I'm going to lose my breath and she said, I'm just going to suffocate myself. So she's down at the bottom, <laughs> breathing. In her nice clothes, she, now she's down, just trying to breathe. So, I think she was in there for like three or four hours. She missed, oh the other woman got the job. She was, so anyway, I'm still in college, still doing my gatherings and everything. My phone rings, because I give her my phone. I answer the phone, she's like, is the Holy Spirit that cruel? <laughs> See how the easy the projection goes on the Holy Spirit. Is the Holy Spirit that cruel <laughs> that he would have me over here in Bogota for this job and then he would about suffocate me <laughs> in this office, you know? And she was like, and I just was just like, <laughs> oh my God. Because we had talked about this, you know, because I, I said, you know, it's like, if you really feel something strong, strongly, and you give a strong yes to it, and you start moving toward it, you better be ready. The ego is going to try to pull something. It's going to try to sabotage. What, that's what it is. It's a sabotage mechanism. That's, it's a death wish. What would you expect a death wish? How would you expect a death wish to, to think and to feel? It would feel like death, it would feel like guilt, it would feel like pressure, and it turned into, for her, she enacted this big kind of sabotage attempt. And then she came back and she just, she came to the gathering and she finally just told the whole thing, expressed all of her emotions, and then she got the biggest smile on her face and said, I'll be up there in a couple weeks. Uh, and she, she did, she came up, she came up to the Peace House and she, she didn't even translate the words, from the English words to the Spanish words. She prayed there, in front of that English website, and, and then through the prayer, she... Just received. Yeah, she received the Spanish uh, translation through that. So it's just, I tell you that story, because when you were talking, I, I kept thinking of Sylvia, that's her name, and 
and how extreme it was. But the thing about it is when you have a strong feeling and you really have the faith, like it may not even make sense in terms of the world. That's how my life went. You know, Jesus got me out on the road and I'm thinking, I don't even like to travel. I don't like to travel. And he's got me on the road for, I thought he might have me on the road for a few days. <laughs> he had me on the road for five and a half weeks. And then when I got back, he got another trip of six weeks. And then he went on for five years. He had me on the road for five years and I don't even like to travel. That's how Jesus works. You know, if you have to undo a self-concept and pride and thinking you know best and you know how to survive and you're in control of your life and all these different things, which is really just a self-concept, it's just a make-believe image, then I was a tough nut to crack. I was a really, I had 10 years of university, I really thought I knew something. After 10 years of university, I really thought I knew something and he's like, now come on out on the road with me. We'll just see. But he provided. He, he would take me to these Course in Miracles groups, and there was potlucks, and they were the best food to the best restaurants. Everything was flying at me so fast. I had a woman who traveled with me at the beginning, and she gained like, like 45 pounds. Her <laughs> hips, her thighs bulged out because we were offered so much food at these Course in Miracles <laughs> potlucks and she could not resist all this good food and she got back to Cincinnati and she's like, <laughs> she had these big, big, thick thighs because she could not resist the food, you know. And I said, listen, let's take it easy on ourselves here, we're just beginners. <laughs> all right, your thighs are thick, but you know, I can't. I can't I can't judge that, you know, I'm sorry. She's like, I'm fat. No, I'm not going to go there. I'm not going there. <laughs> but, but you have to be gentle with yourself too. But also I know for myself, after 10 years of university, he took me on road trips for five years. And, and again, why did he do that except for me to build trust? Except him saying at the beginning, I'll take care of you. Don't worry about the money, don't worry about where you're going to stay, don't worry about the food, don't worry about the transportation. I will take care of everything. Think of it, if you were given a call from God and you were going to be a bringer of light, you're going to bring shine, light and love and joy all over and he wants to hug through you and smile through you and laugh through you. And if, if the Spirit is telling you, I'll take care of everything else, of course the ego is not going to buy that. You know, when you ask, Mike was asking about that, so of course, I'm going out on the road, I don't even like to travel, I don't have no money in the bank, I don't have church support, I don't have organizational support, I don't have stocks, CDs, portfolios, I can just tap into credit cards and do this and that. No, I'm, I'm out there without I mean, I, was, I had enough money to buy the three-cylinder car and have a little bit of gas money to get me going, and then first night out he's got me staying in a campground listening to a blind guy sing, and everybody's swaying and laughing, and I'm like, oh, this is not even close to my life, you know, staying at a campground listening to a blind guy sing, and then the, the, second, the, the second night out, we go, I, go into, I go into Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I'm driving into Tulsa, you know, in my little three-cylinder car, and I'm like, now what? And this is only the second night. Second night out with Jesus. I've already got the blind guy, uh, I've got over that. I mean, <laughs> Kumbaya, first night, you know. I got through that one. But then I'm going to Tulsa, and then I've got this, these little uh, papers that are miracle distribution lists, of course in miracles groups. And so he's like, yeah, here's one. Uh, this one's at a church, and um, it's 11 to 12, and he's telling me, you know, go here, go here, and back then I used maps, we didn't have GPS back then, so I, so I finally I get, I get to the place, it's a church, and it's a Course in Miracles group, and it's from 11 to 12, and it's like, I look at my watch, and it's 10 minutes to noon, and I said, I'm not going in there. That, that, it's over, it's, it's, it's over, I'm not going to walk in 
on a Course in Miracles meeting with only 10 minutes to go. And Jesus is like, yeah, I brought you here for this meeting, so get in there. So I'm like, 10? That's embarrassing. But <laughs> listen and follow. So I go, I go in there, and it was a course group. I walk in, they're in there talking, and there, it was the final 10 minutes of the group, and they have had a big talk about sexuality. Big debate about sexuality. That's what they were talking about. There was a real intense talk in the course meeting about sexuality. And I just kind of sit down, kind of on the side. I don't want to really like, be known and, that I'm here. And so I sit down, and they talk for 10 more minutes on sexuality. And then, okay, let's, okay, they're breaking up and everything. And then the one guy looks over, when did you come in? I'm like, oh, yeah, 10 minutes ago. Well, well, we're so glad that you're here. And I'm taking this group out to eat. You come with us. I'm taking you out to eat. Jesus rolls out the red carpet, you know. Walk in with 10 minutes to go on a group you've never been to. I've never been to Tulsa, Oklahoma. I've never been to a course group in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And now, oh, come on. You come. I'm taking you out to eat. You come with us. So we have a big happy lunch. And then the same guy who invited me to lunch, he's like, well, what are you doing? Are you just passing through? Yeah, yeah, I'm just passing through. Well, come on to my house. Come on to my house. I've got a condominium. Right, go over there. Get in there. It's a nice condominium. It's got a cool tennis court and everything. And he said, I got some work to do this afternoon, but you make yourself at home. Mind you, I've never been to Tulsa. I don't know this man. I don't know this group. I've only gotten 10 minutes of the course meeting, and now I'm in his house. You eat anything you want out of the fridge. You can use the jacuzzi. You want to go out to the tennis court, go swimming. You talk about me casa, su casa. Yeah, yeah. And then he's, and he's like, I got some work to do. He wasn't even there. He's turning over the whole condominium to me, food and all. He's never met me. And I'm like, this is. Jesus is like, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, this is what I mean. Knock your socks off. Watch, they're just getting started. Then I went there. So he goes away. I just am relaxing. Maybe the jacuzzi, pool. Having a great time like I'm in a Marriott. Uh, <laughs> for free. And then, finally he comes back around 4.35 and he goes, I got a good idea. I said, what? He said, you seem to know a lot about that Course in Miracles, and, and we're struggling with it, really. It's a difficult book for us. I got a houseboat. I'm going to call a group up together, and we'll all go out. Let's have a potluck on the houseboat. This is Sunday night now. So out we go. We go on this beautiful lake, and we're on the roof of the houseboat. Having They ask me all the questions about what does the Course say about sexuality, and What's the ego say, and what's the spirit, how does the spirit use it? You know, they had all their really important questions they wanted to ask about that, because that was what they were debating at the end of their group. So I was talking and sharing, sharing with them, and finally, and we're just, we've got watermelon, and we're spitting the, the seeds out over the, in the water, and the moon lights out, and it's shimmering on the lake, it's just surreal. This is not the life of David. David doesn't like to travel. Now Jesus is like, come with me, like a whole new world. A new world. <laughs> he's like, he's like Aladdin. He's like the genie. Like I'll show you. You have your little closed, fearful life. I'll. You need to learn to trust me, and if you do, I'll show you that I do handle it. Now in the Course of Miracles, he says, if you'll do miracles for me, if you'll let me perform miracles through you. Even just going and sharing with this group was very miraculous. If you'll allow me to perform miracles for you, he says, I will arrange time and space for you. How's that? Think about that, Florence. Think about that. You know, if, if you are willing to be used for this purpose, as a conduit of love, as a miracle worker, call it whatever you want, in, in your life's function, Jesus comes right out and says, I will arrange time and space for you. Now that is way outside of my box of survival on planet Earth. But, that was the second night out. 
And it continued. Then I went to Oklahoma City, and this woman I met in New York, she said, well, I'm so glad you stopped by and see me. I'm going to have a great time here with you. Let's go out to the Cowboy Hall of Fame tonight. And I'm like thinking, Cowboy Hall of Fame? And Jesus is like, you go. It's all about the joy, the attitude, the connection. You don't be judging the Cowboy Hall of Fame. You go out with her. Her name was Mar Marcella Branch. And I still remember it. That's a lot of years ago, too. That was 1991. And she took me in, took me to dinner, took me to the Cowboy Hall of Fame in Oklahoma City. It's like when you say yes, and when you really are willing to just honestly trust and believe that you're not personally in charge of your life anymore, but you want to do it for the greater good of everyone, I mean really, to heal your mind, to transcend the ego, then when Jesus says he will, he will you know, or orchestrate, will arrange time and space for you, he just is not joking about these things, you know. He, he says, he's got 50 principles at the beginning of the book, and one of them is, you can heal the sick and raise the dead, because you made sickness and death, and can abolish them both. How's that? Trying that one on for size. That's pretty big, you know, for most of us we would say that's a pretty big order there. But he's actually saying, that's what the whole point of this mind training is. That's what he did. Even in the Bible it says, greater things than I will you do. You know, things like that. Now he's like, here he comes again. So, in, in essence, what I'm saying is, is that when you get, start to get a, a swirl in your heart, a, a strong feeling of, of guidance, that's that nudge. And I was willing to do anything. And then he arranged, I had a little bit of money, he took me to a car dealership, I got a used car, I had a little bit of money for gas, I got out, out from Cincinnati, Ohio, I started heading west, and, and then, I don't know, somewhere it just, I, I got into the trust in such a deep way, and then the more I continued on, and it continued happening day after day, you know, imagine being on the road for about five years. The first thing, practically, I would say, if somebody told me about that, I would like, where are you going to stay? It's one thing to go out for a couple days and try it as an experiment, but Jesus didn't tell me five years. I probably would have <laughs> said, oh, I don't know who you are, but <laughs> you are no. not. I am not. But then he took me little by little, so the trust kept building, and then it turned into five basically five years. And that's the way it works with all of us. He takes us where we believe we are and then slowly builds our confidence in this. And that's just a little teeny sliver of the miracles because, because it is a convincing. We do have to be convinced. We have a lot of programming and conditioning that's very fearful. In fact, that's the way I was leading my life. Uh, most of the time in university, I would say fear of future consequences. That's why would I be in university for ten years if I didn't have a strong fear of future consequences? So that was a lot of unconscious, like darkness that had to get washed away. But I just took it day by day, moment by moment. You know, I didn't really try to think of it in terms of a a big scheme. Where will I be in five years? You know, Jesus is like, where is your mind right now? You know, kept. Like, pay attention, stay open, just stay open and to be truly helpful and then let let me guide the way, and, and that's the way that it went. David, don't you think that when the doubt comes, it's because the, the universe is already uh, answering you, that it's not, it's not, it's not the, the truth, it's, it's not, like the ego. Don't you think so? Yeah. The doubt think, comes. Yeah, the, because when you, when you know, we don't have any doubt. Yeah, that's it. When you, even even if just for a moment you have that peaceful mm -hmm. point, you're you're open to the miracle. Yeah. Because he says miracles cannot be performed in the spirit of doubt. So when you get into the doubt, mm -hmm. you get into the fear. Yeah. 
And even though the light's still shining in there, it doesn't make it through because that dark filter of fear is covered over, it's blocked the light. So, he does, he's very practical, he says, now it doesn't mean that you have to be completely free of the fear to be a miracle worker, because you wouldn't even need miracles if you could be completely free of the fear. You know, he's so wise, you know, he's like, yeah, I know you're doubting, I know you're fearful, but if you could just have some of these calm moments where you can let me come through, and then if you follow what I tell you, what I guide you to in this, you'll be convinced. It's the same thing, you know how we talked about no private thoughts and no people pleasing. Initially, if we bring up that no private thoughts, no people pleasing, usually for people the, the first reaction is there's some kind of fear, it's uncomfortable, like, oh, that does not sound good at all. No private thoughts. <laughs> oh, heavens. I learned long ago I, to keep secrets and to hold on to things, because why? Because we'll be rejected and abandoned if we, if we practice no private thoughts. Imagine sitting there with your mother. Mom, there's some things that I've really been wanting to tell you for a long time. And you're thinking, this is not going to go well at all. I might not have a mother. After 10 minutes, I can zip it. I've been zipping it for 20 years. I'm not going to do this. But what it is, is we do have discernment so that we have people that are sent to us. Maybe they're dear friends or close friends, people we can trust. People that really, we really feel the love with them. We can do it with one person. If we have one person that we feel that love and connection for, that trust, we can start to say, well, here's what's going on. I'm not happy about this, and I'm afraid of this, and then that, Jesus was working with me with that long before the course. He would have me with friends, we would be out in the car, and we would steam up the car for like five hours. Once we'd get up the courage to start pouring out our hearts and saying what was, what we were really thinking and feeling. Then we would sit there and we would do it for each other and we would steam the car up at night, uh, on a cold night because we were just on a roll. But that was, that's almost like a going into a confessional if you're a Catholic, and you're supposed to be able to pour out your your thoughts and your fears. And since you start, you start your, your release. Yeah. Because it yeah. It, it starts you in a new direction where you start to realize that by holding things, and denying and repressing things, that's how you keep them. Yeah. And by exposing them and feeling more confident in, in those things we call expression sessions and heart-to-heart -heart talks, then you actually feel your heart softening. Yeah, you feel like, oh, thank you for letting me share this with you. It really was bothering me, but I was bottling it up and then I, I shared it. I saw we've had some hands in the back. Uh, yeah, it was actually pretty much the same thing. Uh, I was gonna, I was gonna ask how, how you do it practically. Like, how can you know if it's a guidance, or if it's the ego, or if it's just a random wish, or how do you put it in practice? Well, to me, that the, the how do you tell the difference is, is what I call like a discernment, and I saw for myself that it was, it took me, it, it took me years and years and years actually of prayer, uh, to, because I was, a, I think, a tough nut to crack and also a pretty slow learner, but it, it, I had to have a lot of faith to just keep praying and asking. Jesus would say, in the Course he says, at the most basic level, the very most basic level, it's how do you feel? In other words, what is your feeling? Are you feeling a deep sense of peace? A deep sense of, of joy? Are there, is there a mixed emotion coming in there? Do you have some doubt coming up, some fear, and so on and so forth? Ultimately, the miracles and the guidance of the Spirit, it, it's there to lift you up, it's there to inspire you, and a lot of times I would get, like, this beautiful, clear guidance, and I'd go, ah, like I would know, oh yeah. And then the ego would kick in afterwards, like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Like for example, when I was in grad school, 
I was in grad school there for about nine years, and I was in graduate school, and I got this calm feeling coming over, and it said I should switch from one um, department to another. It was actually in the same, it was called Teachers College, but one was a school psychology program, and one was called Teacher Education. One was very elite. It was a, I was on a full scholarship. There was only like eight of us in the whole program. We had, we almost had a one teacher for every two people. It was a very, it was rated second in the whole country of the United States. It was a very elite program. And then there was this other one that was more about the underpinnings, the, the philosophies, the what's the purpose of education, and everything like this. And at one point, my heart just was so drawn into looking at the deeper, what's the purpose? What's the whole purpose of education, you know, really? Instead of just going around administering Stanford Binet test and waste and being like a psychometrist and just giving tests to students, I was more interested in the philosophical views of it. And so I thought to myself, hmm, that looks pretty good over there. Well, there were eight of us, and then all of a sudden, it was also me undoing my, my issues I had around relationships. I did not have go on my first date till I was 27 years old. So Jesus said, we have to do some work in your relationships here. You, you're too shy. <laughs> you have not been on a date yet. So he puts me into a graduate program with me and seven other women. <laughs> Good way to do it. See how Jesus works? You don't like to travel? He takes you on the road for five years. You've got issues with dating? He has seven pretty women. And with me, out of eight total, we're all on full scholarship. And then, as I'm really wondering, is this where I'm supposed to be in school psychology? One of them gets sick. Then another one drops out. Now we're down to like six. The four teachers are getting frightened, because they're supposed to turn out eight great school psychologists. Now there's six of us. And then another one drops out. Now there's five of us. Teachers are nervous. What's gone wrong? What have we done wrong? Why is our class leaving us and everything? They're just leaving, getting sick and everything like this. So it's down, it's down to five, and then I'm just sitting there and I get this soft feeling come over me. It's time to leave the program and transfer over <laughs> to this other program. And I had this soft feeling like, oh yes, yes. And then the ego's like, are you kidding me? You cannot leave this program. The, the professors are terrified. The, the, the stress is so strong you can cut it with a knife. It's so tense. And you're going to what? You're going to, you're going to go in to your advisor and tell your advisor you're leaving the program. The ego just had a, just like a firestorm of things. And finally, I just prayed and prayed on it, but I had the guidance and the calmness that I was to leave and transfer. And then all the firestorm came. And then I remember going into my advisor, who was one of the four professors, and I remember telling him, well, it's time for me to transfer to this other program. And my prof professor, his name was Joe, he just had a big, he had a mustache and he just got a big smile on his face. And he was just kind of listening to me as I was telling him I was going to transfer over with a big smile on his face. But across the hallway was the head of the department, one of the four, and when he heard me saying I was going to transfer, he came over and he lit into me like a military general. You miserable piece of shit. <laughs> you can't handle it. You can't, you just. Because Jesus had me pray before I went. He said, go in there, share what your guidance is, and be calm. That was all Jesus said. And I thought, things are going real well with my <laughs> advisor smiling here. But the head of the department came in there. And that was just another good time to be defenseless. Blessed are the meek. 
to be defenseless, and just to realize that these were just, again, the ego throwing a big fit over the guidance. You know, we get really calm, clear guidances, and then the ego throws in all the woulda, coulda, shouldas, all the guilt, the pain, there's a lot of guilt in that, you know, they were, he was trying to say, you're, you just aren't worth it, you can't handle it, you know, like that Jack Nicholson, you can't handle the truth, oh yeah, I'm hearing the truth, <laughs> that I can handle, but the, the guilt part, I, thank you very much, but that was actually my last year in um, university, and then Jesus got me for good, uh, I kind of, after, after that one year, the next year, then I basically gave my life over and said, all right, Jesus, you have your way with me. And then off we went like a skyrocket, you know, toward the light, uh, with letting go of all vestiges of, uh, of education. So, yeah, it, 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 takes, it takes discernment, but also when you have that calm feeling and you get that knowingness, you know, you really have to stay with that, like, okay, I have received, this is, this is for me, and I'm not going to be dissuaded from it, I'm not going to, no matter what ego tactics come in to try to throw me off, I'm going to stay with that calmness, and, and always Jesus would bring me back to that calmness. Now, it, it, it did take a, still some years of practice and discernment, though, I'm, I always tell people, like uh, Roberto was saying, you know, it's not a, what you say, a walk, walk in the, the park. Walk in the park. Walk in the park. I mean, there's, you really get to expand your faith and expand your your heart. And and really, at times I would have to pray because it, that not, that it's not a walk in the park, meaning there will be temptations and there will be distractions, but you have to come back, like Francis was saying, to the happiness. Like, for you, that was the thing. Like, I. I know there is a happiness, and I'm going to give my whole life to find that happiness. So that even when things started to drop away in her life, fall away, fall away, fall away, she was sticking with no private thoughts and no people pleasing. Even when her mother, she would talk to her mother, and at one point, her, you had been an atheist, your mom was an atheist from Beijing, at one point, uh, her mother was like, what are you going to do with your life, and how will you survive, and what if you get sick, and, you know, all the mother things that you could, the concerns, the, the fears, that things would come up. And Francis was like, well, this is not for you, but for me, I have to really follow what's calling me. I have to, to go for this. At one point, she did tell her mother, she said to her mother, I'm a minister. Her mother burst into laughter, almost like that was the most ridiculous thing that she could ever hear from her atheist <laughs> daughter. I'm a minister now. <laughs> there was one time, you know, when we talk about the family and the, the guilt around the family and the expectations, there was one time when her mother had an opportunity to go for a visa. You want to share about that? Because that was a very powerful undoing of, uh, of the family self concept. That's like an example of you know, people pleasing with, with my mother because I was already living in Australia and she, at some point, wanted to come to join me. I mean, just to have the, the, the visa to be able to live there from China. So. She went on this long, drawn-out process to apply for a visa, and she was 70 years old. So for that kind of age to apply for a resident visa, she needed to put down $20,000. And she did, and then um, waited for two years. At the time that um, the visa, she got the visa, they say you put down another twenty thousand dollars or something and then I was at a point to I found David and I was about to leave Australia to go to the United States and she was like after her mom had forty thousand dollars on the And she said, What do you want me to do? Do I pay? If I pay I get this visa and I come to Australia but you're not gonna be there. But if I don't pay I will never be able to do this again. 
I think, I think she would lose and, the Chinese uh, citizenship. No, she won't. But she <laughs> said, if I don't pay, if I if I let this opportunity go, I will never be able to to do another two year process, pay all this money because my age. They they're not gonna accept me. What if you after three months you come back? You know. And I said at that point, I said I really don't know how to decide for you. So I cannot decide for you. Please don't make a decision based on me. Please pray and make a decision for yourself, because I'm going, and you make a decision for yourself. So she, you know, we were very tight in the relationship. It, 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 normally she would blame me. You did this to me. But at that point, I just said, please make a decision for yourself, because I can't do that. And I made a decision for myself to go, and I cannot tell you whether I come back or not. And、uh, I never did. And she paid, and she never went. But she never blamed me because because we were be able to join in that authenticity in that moment. I didn't say, well, just do it and. Like we were very honest, and it was not a comfortable moment. But we never had resentment or complain from that point on. It was a very independent decision. It was clearly untangling all ego expectations around the mother-daughter concept. And and I should say,、um, I have a miracle parable too to go with that one. Was when Francis and I went to China. Uh, you know, we we went to Beijing, but and did some traveling and everything. But when we went there, my teachings had been translated into Mandarin and just proliferated all over China. So, the first time we were there, there was over a hundred people、uh, to, to hear us. And then one time we went with a whole group of us, and there was in Shanghai two hundred and twenty-five people, and you could hear a pin drop. Two hundred twenty-five people there from all over, from over by India and far reaches of different parts of China. They came from all over. But when we were, I think at one point we were early on, we were in Beijing, and we had so many people that wanted to meet with us, so many things going on that basically Francis was keeping track of all of our invitations and all the people we had to meet. And then tinglingling, the phone rings. It's mom. Uh, when are you going to have time for lunch with your mother? And she's like, "Well, no, no, no. it's a real full schedule, Mom." <laughs> Just very matter-of-factly, almost like here's all the people who want to be with us, and now here's one more that wants to have. And so she had to be very matter-of-fact and and say, "Well, well, if there's time, there'll be time, but right now we are we are a full slate here." There's no room right here right now, but her mother had all kinds of questions like, "What are you doing?" and "What is this all about?" and everything. And then Francis, again, the spirit came through her very graciously. The spirit always is gracious. The spirit is always loving, even if it's like there's no room in the schedule. It's like, well, mom, actually, you can go. David has. There's a website. Where all of David's teachings are in Mandarin, so just go read the web- website if you have questions.、Uh, don't have time, gotta go. So, <laughs> so this is an example of no people pleasing with mom. So what does mom do? She goes to read the website, and she's very curious. So she reads a lot of the website, a lot of the website. She's reading a lot of the questions and the answers. She's. Very concerned and interested in what her daughter is giving her life over to, so she loves her and she reads a lot of the websites. Then, when she comes together with Francis, you can pick it up because she had read the website. Yeah, I think the part of the reason she even would go to read the website is because I really wasn't compromising to meet to meet with her because I didn't have time. She keep going. First, was very angry. I'm your mother. I'm special to you. What you never come back to see me now? And so it was a lot of complaint. But because I just didn't have time for that, so she became more and more and more and more curious. But by the time I said, "Well, this is the one chance we can join. If you read、um, the website, then you know what I'm doing." So she did, and then、um, then finally we had time to 
to to come together. And she said, "I read this website that David had. He think this world is not real." <laughs> And she's like, "What is he talking about?" <laughs> and he says, "You know, the people and this world is not real. So if the world is not real, what about us? What about our relationship? What is this this mother daughter relationship? How do you explain that to me? What is he talking about?" She was, she was so curious, and I just, I thought, I prayed a little bit, and I said, "Well, it's just like." A nighttime dream, you know, when in the dream we dream up a whole world. We have all kinds of characters. We have people who have relationship with us in the dream. This world is actually not much different than that. There is a mind behind that projects out a world like a dream, and all these characters. So our relationship is the dreamer of the dream versus a dream character. That's the kind of. And she was fascinated by that. She listened and listened and listened, and in the end, she said, "So, who am I?" is the only real question then. Great. From from a woman who was an atheist, who am I is the only real question. From her not compromising, and her mother reading that, she comes to who am I is the only real question, and then it goes on from there. It doesn't. It gets even better. Because then, after time passes, her mother had her first mystical experience、wow. from Francis not compromising with her mother to her mother asking that. That's the only question to having her first mystical experience. Then she calls Francis, and then she says, "How am I supposed to tell my friends about this mystical experience?" Good question, right? <laughs> Any of you have had? Mystical experience. How do you how do you tell your friends, and what did you tell her? I said, "There's no way you can explain that. It's just for yourself."、Yeah. It's just for you. Yeah. But to me, I, that's what I love about this because this is showing how important it is the no people pleasing, no private thoughts. In a mother daughter situation, she stayed true. She just stayed in with her guidance. She stayed clear. And then initially, there was a pretty good ego. Whiplash, ego backlash. Like I'm, I'm your mother. I hardly get to see you. You know the typical things you would hear. But eventually, just remember the end of the parable is that she has a mystical experience for the first time in her life, and she says that. And who am I is the only question that there is. That just shows you how profound it is, and that should give you more courage and strength to start to let your yes be yes, your no be no. And those are the kind of things I had to do with my my family. I remember I started to live, read the course. I was living so simply. I didn't have a job. Things were being provided in all kinds of miraculous ways. But I remember I went to my niece's birthday party, and all the other people there brought presents, and I was living such a simple life. It'd be like living a life of a monk or a mystic. So. I pray. I'm guided to go to the birthday party, and then I'm in there. We have the cake and the ice cream and all the celebration and everything. And then, as it's time for me to go, I go and I say bye to everybody. I go out the door, and as I'm out the door, here comes my little niece with that little niece face. She comes up, Uncle David. Didn't you get me a present? This is where you really get to try your mind training. You know, your cute little face, going, Uncle David, didn't you get me a present? And I just prayed, and then Spirit spoke through me and said, "Well, you know, every time we play together and we laugh together and we just share all this joy we have together, that's my present." And she went. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and I got the immediate reflection back of the acknowledgement of yeah, that the joy of us, the attitude, the joy that we share together is the present.、Yeah. It's not the thing. You know how we've been fooled with Christmas and all the what did you get me? And it's turned so materialistic. You know the ego turns everything that's holy and sacred. It turns it into a big focus on the form. Did you get me a present? Why did they get a bigger present than I did? You know how the ego works; it's very strong. But 
that's the kind of thing where the people pleasing, we, we have to really see that if we're going to really follow the Spirit, the Spirit will always give us if there's words to speak, or there's a way to extend love, the Spirit will, will give us that. We will not be ever deprived. We, we will always be able to share the love in the most helpful way. So it's been, that's, that's important, I think, for all of us. That's why we're sharing some of these parables, because these are the things that come up when you start to really follow the Spirit. Yeah, just you learn to trust for everything. 46, wow, flies <laughs> by fast. Can I just want to say quickly one thing, and maybe you can, I don't know, it was about, I did recently heard about the description of the reality, and the person was, uh, it was a podcast, it, he used basically like a user interface description, like an app, like when you look at the Waze or Google Maps, that's not the reality, but you really need some kind of interface, and it's a different way to explain it, just saying it, because you used a couple of times different explanations. <coughs> And I like how this is just the user interface, right? I mean, it's we interact yeah. through it, but that's not the real thing. It's like the app, you're interacting through, but the ways is bringing you somewhere, but that's not the real thing. Mm -hmm. It's just something that helps you to navigate the system, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's so, beautiful because you you can clearly say the way, so the app is 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 not an actuality, but it, it's a use of symbols that help. It's very practical and very helpful. And I think if we can start to think of everything in this world as symbolic, it's when we pull it away from the symbolic and we make it into an actuality, then, then it would be like nighttime dreams, you know, instead of looking at what, what was, what am I supposed to learn from the dream, What's, what were the symbols telling me, it would be to react to the monster as if the monster is real, even though it's a dream monster or react to what happened to us, which is what we can do when we're sleeping. You know, where you, you're, you're sweating and your heart's pounding and then you wake up and you go, oh, I'm so glad that was a dream. You know, you immediately dismiss the whole thing, your heart calms down, you quit sweating because you think, I just had a nightmare, and then that's just a dream. But then if you think you're waking up into real life, and that's a real boss, and those are real children, and that's a real house, and those are real threats, then, you know, the stress will will come in there. So that's, it's good to remember that that's why we're, we're sharing these examples, and, and that's why you practice the mind training. So the highest state of mind you can come to is just to see that you're the dreamer of this dream. You know, that's, that's the highest state. To be a lucid dreamer, to be aware that you're dreaming, as you're looking upon this world. There is no higher state of mind that relates to this world. Because then it could be dragon, it could be fire, flames, tsunamis. You'd be like, as the giant wall of water was coming in, you would be like, cool, you know? Because you're not the character that's about to get washed <laughs> three miles down the road. You're the dreamer of the character and the wave. You know, it's a big difference to be a lucid dreamer. But that, we're not trying to, you know, just say, oh, you click your fingers three times and then you're the dreamer. You know, this actually takes practice. Any spiritual path you have. I mean, we know that with our jobs and careers and everything. We had to put a lot of effort into learning those things. Anybody, a ballet dancer, an athlete, anybody has to put a lot, of, an actress has to put a lot of, time into practicing those lines, memorizing those, memorizing those lines. There's a lot of work. Jesus is just saying, why don't you give me that same effort for your mind training, and we'll work together, and then I'll free your mind, and, and also free the whole world through that mind training. So tomorrow at 10, do you have anything to share about that? Maybe a song Maybe or we, experience? We'll announce tomorrow. You'll announce it tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. All right. Happy dreams. Happy dreams. All right. Enjoy.